live episode. Willie Delinko here as uh, our guest. And once again, we got Joe Fowler here. So guys, don't forget, uh, we're coming live from Facebook and also YouTube. So if you're on Facebook, uh, like and share. Please share the show on Facebook. And also if you're on YouTube, uh, like and subscribe. All right, uh, appreciate that, and hopefully we can keep bringing you good stuff. All right, so want to introduce a good friend of mine uh, I've known for a few years. Uh, his name is Willie Delinko, and Willie, when I first met Willie, you know, he was uh, trying to sneak into uh, a meetup event. <laughs> <laughs> I did sneak in. Did you really? I, I was just joking about that. No, I definitely snuck in. Yeah. So um, just hold the mic close to your, uh, yeah. yeah. So w Willie, uh, give us, give the audience a quick intro of, of yourself and kind of what you're doing now. All right. So, hey guys, um, name's William Delinko. Uh, my company name is Sharp Realty Solutions. I got started about five, six years ago, um, coming to an event, Nick Tang's event, saw Joey there, saw a bunch of guys there and just really started. Didn't really know what was going on at the time, but I knew I wanted to jump into real estate and figure out um, how to make money. So started doing, uh, going to networking events and then learned about wholesaling. And I finally got the guts to put a property under contract. And then I lost the contract. Um, I remember that story. Yeah. Um, what kind of contract? It was a wholesale Hold deal. It. it was a wholesale deal. Um, property was in foreclosure. Didn't really know what, what what I was doing. You know, I just needed to help the seller out, get out of the situation. So, you know, every time I would go talk to the seller, I would come back to one of the meetups, connect with a lender, um, one of the guys in the room, and really ask them those questions. Right. You know, you really need to go out there and do it so you understand what questions to ask. Um, so when you go out there, you figure out the challenges, then you come back and you network and you, know, you get the, you get the answer to that question. So, um, long story short, we're, we're doing this now six years. We specialize in short sales. Um, we're doing this, we're, we're in eight States now, specifically in New Jersey, New York, um, and a couple of other States and, you know, business is booming right now. Business is booming for the past couple of years during COVID. There's short sales left and right. People are in forbearance plans, coming out of them. You know, they're underwater. So we're providing a lot of solutions to a lot of people right now. That, that actually hits on a, a quick topic I wanted to discuss. Yesterday, on um, it was uh, circulating in the media. I'm not sure if you guys saw it about the foreclosure and foreclosure rates are, that they're increasing. Did you guys see that on Yahoo? And it was on Realtor.com. And... I did like my own little uh, unscientific sort of survey. I went on auction.com and I used PropStream as well. And the, the, the majority of the cities they were mentioning that, have, that their foreclosure rates are increasing. I think they were more discussing, the, they were more speaking to like the Les Pendants letters, Les Pendants, but not yeah. the foreclosures themselves. I don't think it got into that stage, but I'm checking on auction.com, Alabama, uh, Orlando, it was like 10 different states, Connecticut, uh, New Haven. And when I'm going on auction.com and I'm checking on prop stream for the same information, and you're, I'm only seeing 50, 60 foreclosures or, or, or properties on auction.com, maybe 50 of them. Yeah. So please take that information that you see on the media with a grain of salt. Mm -hmm. cool. And they're comparing it to last year's numbers where there weren't any. So yeah. even if it goes up, we discussed this before, even if it goes up by three foreclosures, so now it's up 300%. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? So take that information that you see on the media, put a grain of salt, you know, li uh, listen to everything with a, like a fine tooth comb and really pay attention to the Yeah, I mean, definitely look, look beyond the headlines, right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Don't, don't just be a headline reader, basically. Exactly, right? yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, so with... Um, so, so you said that business is booming in terms of short sales, right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So, can you walk people through like 
the the short sale process, right? What what is a short sale? First of all, right? I mean, I I know what it is, but I'm just saying, uh, walk walk us through what is a short sale process and how you actually help the the seller or the homeowner through that process. You know? Sure. So typically. You know, I wake up in the morning and I get phone calls uh, on a daily from wholesalers, investors, yeah. you know, realtors with these leads that they just don't understand how to convert. A lot of the leads lately have been um, probates okay. that are in foreclosures. You know, I guess during COVID, we lost a lot of people. So, you know, a lot of my leads are they're not just a foreclosure going to auction. They're, there's a probate. Probate meaning what? They have, you know, the, per the homeowner passed away and now the property needs to go through a probate for someone um, of the family to become the executor of the estate to even start a short sale or a workout option to sell that property. So the lead will come in, will connect typically with whether it's the homeowner who's still alive or it's the, the brother, the sister whose mother passed away who owned the property. And the first thing we need to do is, number one, is, is there an auction date scheduled? Mm -hmm. That's typically the priority, my priority. So we find out if there's an auction date scheduled. If there's no auction date scheduled and it's a probate, you know, we go right into probate, you know, um, where typically in New Jersey, it's really easy process. You file um, uh, the documents at the surrogate court's office. If there's a bunch of children, you know, involved, someone needs to be appointed as the executor. So, you know, each of the kids, you know, Sally, Jesse, and, and Bob needs to appoint the bigger brother as the executor of the estate. Mm -hmm. So they have to renounce um, their rights to that brother. Application gets filed in the probate surrogate court. A couple weeks later, the court spits out an executive letter appointing that person the right to sell the property and satisfy the debt. Without that letter, you can't even talk to the bank. Mm. Um, so you need that letter first to actually appoint someone so then they can authorize us to actually start open up communications with the bank and get, get the paperwork rolling, um, order payoff, and actually just finally communicate with the bank. These people haven't communicated with their bank months, years, so this is the first time the bank is actually hearing from someone regarding this property that they haven't been collecting on in yeah. a long time. Now, does it have to be just, let's say, the heirs, the kids? No, no, it could or, be, or... it could be, um, you know, we typically either, it's either going to be it for us, um, mm -hmm. it's either going to be one of the, the heirs or it's going to be an attorney. Oh. You know, we're going to, we're going to appoint it to the attorney and they're going to take responsibility of that, um, executorship so but mo most of my deals we've had an heir step up to the plate and we've appointed them you know 95 percent of of all our probate deals we've appointed a brother or sister or you know a spouse yeah. as the executor now so, let me ask you what if there what, what if there is no heir like there's nobody you know like you can't find any of your kids they all passed away or whatever happened yeah, it's a good oh. question. So it trickles yeah. down. So it's it's either, you know, it's either the the husband if they're married. Right. There's no husband, then it's the kids. If there's no kids, then it's the siblings. If there's no siblings, you know, um, we haven't gotten into that situation yet, and it's a very good question because, you know, who would actually take rights to the house then? And right. you know, I would assume because we haven't gotten to that situation yet. I would assume we would have to dig a little deeper mm -hmm. to figure it out. Um, we would obviously talk to our, our probate attorney and to help guide us through that. But yeah. no, it's a very interesting question. Um, luckily, for we, we've we've had you, ha you haven't had we that haven't situation. had that yet. So uh, that's good. Yeah, yeah. No, I was just curious. You know, uh, it wasn't any like actual situation or anything. So yeah, I mean, we have to get creative on a lot of these deals. Yeah. It's every deal we are constantly getting creative. Um, you have to, you know, you're dealing with a lot of distressed mm -hmm. people here and, you know, I, you know, you know, my personality, I get very yeah. personal with people. Sure. So I constantly am building rapport. I'm talking to these, my clients on a daily basis and sometimes till 12 o'clock at night, I still do it. 
Um, I'm, I'm, I'm freeing up a lot of my time now to get off the phone. Mm. But I, you know, I, I, I go into this, into the deal very personal with them and, and I get to know them and, you know, you really just, you connect with them really good yeah. because a lot of these deals, they can take months or right. I had a deal last three years on me. Wow. So if you're not really close with those people, they can, you could do all this work and then they can ghost you and the deal died. You just spend all that time doing nothing mm. basically. Have you had that happen? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's funny. And me and my partner have really battled with this on how to really just let it go. You know, we've tried to, you know, every deal is, is never dead for us. It's just typically on life support. Mm -hmm. So we've had, you know, we've hired private investigators to track down people. You know, uh, my partner had a deal. The guys went to Ecuador um, and, and Mike was able to really track him down in Ecuador yeah. So you really, you know, it depends on, you know, we have goals for my company and, you know, some deals we want to, you know, keep, keep the deal alive, sure. pump as much oxygen into the deal as possible. But we're learning now after doing that for many years on how to let the deal go and move on as there's other people that need our help that actually want our help. Mm -hmm. So you, but you, you deal with those, you know? Wow. So, yeah, no, I mean, um, so I, I heard that, you know, you could spend so much time with somebody and then they just disappear. They ghost on you. Yeah. You know, right? especially with the probate, because it's, it adds an extra step to even getting, starting the deal. Mm. You know, we can't even start the deal until we, we finalize, you know, is there an auction? We have to cancel the auction multiple times. Right. You know, then once we get the auction canceled, was there a bankruptcy filed? Mm. Do we have to wait for the bankruptcy to be finalized? You know, so every deal is, it's, it's very unique. Right. And you have to be able to pivot in the moment, um, literally in the moment to make sure that, that that deal doesn't either A, go to foreclosure, um, and you're communicating with everyone. Yeah, okay. no, that, that's tough. Um, and, and you also need to know a lot, right? Because there's so many moving parts to, to what you kind of do. Yeah. Right? Um, wow. So that's... Yeah, there's a lot of moving parts. And then... You know, I pride myself on follow up and communication, and that's really all it is. Mm -hmm. You have to follow up. You have to, you know, ask questions multiple times. You know, somebody's, you know, you send a, you send an email. You know, you think it's a great deal. This seller needs a lot of your help, and you you know you go over an hour of how the plan is gonna, mm -hmm. you know, go, and then they just they don't answer their phone for a couple of days. And some people just give up and, you know, it's, it's just a follow up and yeah. getting them back on the phone, getting the documents in order. So um, I think we do a really good job. Can we do better? Absolutely. But, uh, you know, it's a tough game, uh, but uh, we're, we're having a good uh, time right now. Yeah. What, what made you kind of get into doing more, I guess, the, uh, the short sale aspect of, uh, um, of it? I was kind of, it just by accident? Yeah, or, I kind of what? fell into it. I think my first two deals were foreclosures, and I just fell in love with just learning how to... The thought of talking to banks, like, interests me so much by... Not me. Well, <laughs> well what was the, that was going to be my question. What's the, how's the process of talking to these banks? Do you have to be a realtor, first of all, or no. they, once you have the probate letter? No, no, no. Um, so we leverage uh, realtors to list the property. The property, if you're doing a short sale, the property has to be listed as per the bank's guidelines. So we leverage, you know, uh, my, my partner's a broker, so we leverage uh, his license. He lists the properties. And, you know, you, anyone can speak to the bank, whoever the seller is going to authorize. The seller will uh, sign a third-party authorization, and you'll call the bank and ask them a bunch of questions. If you know the right questions to ask and, you know, you hold them accountable to certain things, you'll get the file moved a lot quicker. Hmm. Sometimes I have to educate. The, the person on the other line is, is just an employee. They don't really know much. Um, sometimes I have to actually educate them on the short sale process, <laughs> you know, and it, it gets frustrating. But, you know, you have to really take the emotion out of it. Um, but when, when I have to call a bank six times in, in a, in a five hour pro, you know, period, it, it gets very frustrating because if I don't get what I need out of that representative, I have to hang up the phone, call back multiple times till I get what I need, um, from the rep. 
And these banks are going to tell you whatever. You know, that's why homeowners don't, they get so frustrated when yeah. they try to do their own short sale. They try to really work with the bank. You know, that representative is really just collecting information. They're not really skilled uh, enough to um, understand the whole picture. So it's not a dedicated department, basically any random. I mean, so it makes it hard. The way the banks are set up, I'll be honest with you, like they, they, they guard, they're like gatekeepers. The people that we need to really speak to to get the answers, we're not allowed to speak to them. We have to go through the rep to who then has to get a super, if I have to escalate a file, I have to then X the rep nicely. Can you please escalate this? She'll then call her supervisor who then her supervisor will then reach out to the supervisor in the underwriting department. And then really the two supervisors have to really, you know, talk, talk. Um, so the communication, it's, it's really bad the way they do it. Um, so that really, it, it really slows things down. It's really frustrating. Are you talking directly to the banks or do you go through the, uh, the servicers, servicers? Yeah, we're talking directly well? to the servicers. So, you know. Oh, that makes it even worse. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, and there's many times, you know, where we'll work on a file and the file's not moving. And because of many reasons. And, you know, I have a file in Florida right now where I've been working on this deal for about a year and a half. You know, the guy owes $2 million on the property. Oof. Property's only worth like 900000 Um the bank, you know, he's been in default for about 10 years. So when you're in default for that, you know, certain banks have certain guidelines. You know, FHA, they won't even give you a short sale option after a certain amount of time. Mm. You know, and these private investors, you know, they know, you haven't paid me in 10 years. I've been offering you options. Um, and you've just been playing the system, following bankruptcies, following motions. While still living in the property. While still living in the property, yeah. you know, causing havoc to the HOA. So now when I entered this deal, the, the homeowner was, um, they gave him a short sale. It was approved at mm -hmm. a very good price, but the homeowner wasn't ready to leave. So the homeowner actually, you know, screwed, screwed up um, himself and the buyer who actually was going to purchase that deal. Um, I guess they got into a really bad situation. The buyer clouded the title. So when I get the deal, you know, now I'm brand new. The title is completely a mess. Mm. Um, and now the bank, you know, we, we, we initiate the short sale and the bank is like, nope, we're not giving you that option no more. So I've been fighting this bank for about a year now and I've reached out, you know, you get to a point where you're like, all right, what, what else can we do? So we try to reach out to the note investor, yeah. you know, directly. And I was going to ask you that. Yeah. And, and we really, you know, we've attempted it a couple of times and, you know, the note investor on this deal is Bank of uh, New York Mellon, big, big institutional yeah, yeah, lender. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, we, you, you could play the LinkedIn game and really try to connect with an asset manager from Bank of Mellon, but they, these deals wear you out. So we haven't really been successful in connecting with the note investors to really express to them, we're here to create a win-win for you. You know, this, this, this deal, um, they're going to, they're going to, they not, they won't be able to foreclose because the, the seller's filing bankruptcy left and right. They probably won't be able to foreclose on this property for a couple of and years. This is Florida. This is Florida, yeah. But isn't Florida like one of those quick states where the you know sheriff comes, puts a sticker in, and your stuff is out on the? Um, I mean, yeah, but because of it's a like bankruptcy, Georgia. yeah, but because of a bankruptcy, you can really tie things up. You know, this guy has filed multiple chapters, and you can keep filing chapters, and you can you can really drag it out. So he's just gaming the system. Of course, yeah. And he's renting the property out too, which is highly illegal too. He's not paying It's his a building? Bill. It no, it's a single family home. Yeah. So he's Beautiful renting house. it out to someone else. He's renting out to tenants, yeah, your oh, Airbnb okay. it, this yeah. So it's all profit. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And it's funny too because <laughs> I'm I'm actually, you know, I got into the deal and you know, you, the sellers don't tell you the you know the whole story in the beginning. It takes a lot to really get everything. You gotta, you gotta be a detective. You gotta yeah. really dig in. And right? I, I mean, I'm I'm in this deal for like three grand. I gave the seller three thousand dollars, help him out with cab money, food, this and that to really get him. He should have gave that to you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but this was like a year ago, and I knew you know whatever you put out there, you can lose, right? Yeah. So, um, you got to know that going into this, you know. Uh, and I actually, it's funny. I, I, I live by that. It's actually, uh, you no, know who told me that Chuck, Chuck Cohan. Yeah. Whatever you put out there, you can lose. And I actually just put a deposit of $25,000 on a deal. 
that uh, I, I uh, shouldn't have. I should have really looked at the contract a little better, and I'm in jeopardy of losing that. But I think it's being worked out as we speak. Um, but yeah, man, it's it's every deal is it's crazy. But um, wow. we had, it took a while to get the seller on board for that deal. But now we have the seller. We have title ready to go. We cleared a lot of things. Yeah. But now the, the other piece of the puzzle is the bank. They're like, no, we're not giving you a short sale. And the bank knows they need to short this property because the debt is $2 million. The property is only worth 900000 and it needs about 150 in repairs. Yeah. And they know they would, they would, it would, it would, if they just accepted a short sale. Um, you know, so we, we've contacted attorneys, foreclosing attorneys, to really figure out a, a solution to mm. try to get the bank. And what we've learned is when you leverage the bankruptcy courts, you can actually get the bankruptcy courts to communicate with the foreclosing attorney and to build a rapport with them. And we haven't been successful yet uh, in Florida, but we actually were successful here in Jersey um, where the bank was kept telling us we're not giving the borrower uh, a short sale option. It's either deed in lieu or we're foreclosing. So we leveraged our bankruptcy attorney here in New Jersey to speak. He had actually a relationship with the foreclosing attorney. And based off of his relationship, we were actually able to get them to listen to why it makes sense to actually do a short sale versus foreclosing. Can you explain a little bit what a deed in lieu is to the audience? Yeah, so a deed in lieu is basically you're giving the property back to the bank. Um, you know, I, I, you I just walk, walk away. I totally walk away and, and the bank takes over. But the bank is only going to give you a deed in lieu. First of all, they're going to run title first. Mm -hmm. it's the, the whole application process for a deed in lieu is the bank's going to run title. If title is not clear, they're not giving you a deed in lieu. They don't want the deed back. It's clouded. Right. They want you, me. The, yeah, you, know, you to be the the own the sole owner. No, no other outside. No liens. judgments. Right. No nothing. So we have to clean up the title before we can even present it to the bank. And also, some banks want the property vacant. If, if those two things are not in order, you won't even qualify mm -hmm. for a deed in lieu. So it creates a really bad problem for these homeowners because now, you know, they're not giving them a short sale. They can't get approved for a loan modification to save the property. Right. Now they, they want the banks telling them, screw you, you know, we don't even want the deed back. You know, we'll take it through foreclosure. We'll wipe out the deed, uh, the judgments and, all, and everything. And right. then we'll take the property back. But that, that causes more harm to everyone. You know, because now the bank's got to sit on the property. They got to maintain the property. They got to pay the taxes on the property. They don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and now the homeowner has a foreclosure on his record for seven to ten years. Right. It's insane. So, this whole process just sounds like it's in a like this is like in a like we're in a third world country. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it, it's <laughs> for lack of better words. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean it's. I guess the system's designed this way, but there are solutions to these people and, and to the banks. And that's where, you know, we come in. We, we try to provide the solution and create win-wins, you know. We're turning um, underwater properties uh, to negative equity to positive equity. You're bringing taxes into the city at the same time. Literally. They haven't been paid in however many years. Years, you know, right. years. The property is just an eyesore, you know, molt. The grass hasn't been cut, you know, police... We've had the township, you know, that's what, you know, I think why the banks don't understand that the townships really uh, play a big role in, in, in this game, right? Because now the town needs, you know, they don't, they don't, they don't want the grass, you know, this long, you know, they're going to just keep pounding fines and fines and it's just, you know, they want the property back up and running. Right. So, you know, we're helping out a lot of people in, in the transaction, not just the homeowner, not just the bank. You know, we're bringing uh, title companies. They're getting paid. Attorneys are getting paid. Bankruptcy attorneys. You know, like there's a whole bunch of people, you know, benefiting from these problems. Yeah, there, there's a lot of people in, in the pocket, so to speak. Yeah. Or, you that know, sounds reaching in the pie. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. yeah. it, it just helps the community, you know, with the lack of housing right now. Yeah. Um, wow. affordability through the roof because of the lack of, of, of uh, housing available right now. Rental, you know, there's no properties for sale. Everything's on contract for 30 days. This just makes so much sense yeah. for the bank just to let these go and make, turn some sort of profit. Yeah, you know, the banks are shorthanded too. You know, they don't really have a lot of processes. I think Bank of America was hiring like 100,000 employees to really take over 
you know, the, the influx of, of what's coming. I mean, it's already here, but, you know, there's, there's a lot of properties that just haven't been worked out yet that are sitting vacant or you have homeowners sitting in there that, especially in New Jersey and New York, you know, you can sit in the property for 10 years, you know, so, you know, um, so. Yeah, no, I, I, I seen that because um, when, when I was kind of getting started, I was doing a lot of auctions, auction properties. So I got to see kind of the back end, mm -hmm. you know, of, of what happens at the end of, of the uh, process, right? So, you know, when, when people got foreclosed on, you know, the, the unfortunate part. Yeah. You know, but you don't really, so, but where, when I came in, it was j the actual foreclosure itself at the actual share of sale. So you don't really see the homeowner or anything like that. But on occasion, you will see a homeowner or two. Like for example, I had I had a uh, I had a friend uh, a few years. This is probably around like 2018, something like that, right? And uh, or or 19, some, somewhere in that area. And I had a friend of mine who they they were supposed to do a short sale. And they really tried to game the system, like try to extend it, you know, as much as possible. Because I, I know they were in foreclosure for like four or five or six years already at that point. And I was like, hey, listen, um, why don't we help you do the short sale at that time? And they, they were kind of like, you know, back and forth with me. And then they never allowed me to kind of get in to do the short sale. So I, I brought in a, a realtor at the time to try to help them with, with that. And the realtor wasn't like, Hey, I, uh, I would love to help you do the short sale. And she was like, eh, I'll do it. You know, like, mm -hmm. because, because of me, you know, right. It wasn't like, yeah, that's my favorite thing to do because like you said, you know, calling into banks can be super frustrating, you know, being on hold for like an hour or two hours. So, you know, and then getting someone on the phone and then they don't really know what's going on. Uh, give me all your info, you know, uh, verify who you are. You know, do you have the, uh, um, you know, the, the power attorney or, or the authority to call in, you know, all this stuff. Right. And after they verify all that, the call drops. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> happened to me many times. Yeah. I'm many sure. Many times. So, you know, so, so it's, it's not, not everybody likes to do this stuff, right? Um, it takes patience. It takes a lot of patience. Like it's something that I, I personally wouldn't do, but, um, having a team or having people that knows how to do it is amazing. Like right. if I have this situation, I, I just, you know, I was like, Hey, it's, you know, call my boy Willie, you know, I yeah. might have one. I found something, uh, the other day in Linden. Yeah. High grass. I pulled over, pulled it up on prop stream <laughs> foreclosure. Yeah. We'll discuss afterwards. Absolutely. Yeah, we'd love to help you out. I mean, they're just everywhere. I, I mean, I leave my house and I just see it. I know that property is, yeah. you know, you see the grass, you see a letter on the door, you know, and, and I, it's so funny because my time is so limited now, you know, I'm just like, I can easily just make one phone call to figure out, it's, it's not that hard to figure out. Um, how to really get involved in that deal, right? Mm -hmm. you, you see a property that's distressed. You see some letters on the door. You knock on the door or you just skip trace who owns that property. You get their name, their phone number, and you call them and you connect with that homeowner. Yeah. And, you know, you, you go, once you connect with the homeowner, you're, you're, you're in. That, that's the hardest part. Luckily for us now, I mean, 99% of my business is referrals. Yeah. You know, we're doing a little bit of marketing now. We're cold calling, but um, we have agents door knocking for us. So it's our leads are just referrals after referrals. And um, it, there's just so many of these these deals out there where you know they go going to auction. I get calls the day of the day before the auction is it, it's happening. So, yeah. How, how do you. Yeah. I, that, that was actually one of the questions I was going to bring up. How do you deal with that? You know, if somebody calls you like, hey, I'm getting foreclosed on tomorrow. You know, tomorrow's the auction date and it's it's been posted. You know, how do you deal with that? Yeah. So, I mean, in New Jersey, it's it's not that hard. It's it's doesn't take that much work. You first in New Jersey, you have two adjournments. Mm -hmm. So if so if, both of them have been used, All right, both of them have example. been used. So then we'll typically file the third adjournment, which is a motion. 
and you know an application has to be filled out and you have to really speak with the home this is how it's done the third the, no one really no one really knows about the third motion yeah um they just think they have two two adjournments but they actually have a third one um so you really connect with uh you know we, we connect we, we connect with the homeowner and we we get what's called the time of events of what's been going on mm -hmm. so you have to really name all the time of events in that motion and provide your case to the judge to really hear your case and why she should give you an additional 30, 60, 90 days. So we prepare um, the time of events and we, you know, we get the story. There's always a story with each property. Sure. So you put it on paper on a nice fancy legal document and then our attorney will go to the judge and they'll have a Zoom meeting and they'll They'll go back and forth on why this property, you know, a lot, like I said, a lot of these deals are probate. So mm -hmm. our main argument to the judge is like, hey, first of all, you're naming the homeowner's name in this foreclosure. We actually need to name the estate in the foreclosure. So the bank has to do their foreclosure process all over again. Mm. Or we'll typically, you know, we don't, we just got this deal yesterday. There's potential equity in this house. We don't know if it's a short sale. We haven't had time to speak with the bank yet, order a payoff. So we need to really, we need some time to identify the whole picture and there's potential, there might be potential equity in this property that the homeowner or the heirs can walk away with. So typically the judges, when they hear these, they, they, they don't want to foreclose. They, they'll, they're, yeah. they're in favor of the, the homeowner. So they'll give us 60, you know, we really want a minimum of 37 days because, mm -hmm. you know, if we don't have 37 days, you know, we, the bank needs 37 days to get. Um, the application under review before an auction. If there's an auction scheduled and we don't have 37 days prior, the bank is not even going to review you for right. a workout option. So that timeline is crucial. So it's all about just buying time, buying time. So two adjournments, the third adjournment will give us another 60, 90 days, depending on the mood of the judge, mm -hmm. right? Um, and... That's super important. Yeah, so you need that time, and then once you have that time, you want to get right to work. You know, you really want to. The homeowner is motivated at that point. You get all the documents uh, executed, signed. The property gets listed. You submit everything to the bank, and then you get under review. Once you're under review, now the bank, if there's a, if the, if the judge gave us 90 days, she didn't just cancel the auction. She just get, she just kicked the can. Down, down the road, road. Right. so there's a new sale date now for 90 60 days and that that number is you know, we're, we're paying attention to that date because we need to get the file into review our goal at that point is to get the ca uh, auction canceled um, until it's canceled the anxiety is high stress is high everyone's on yeah. you know what's going on <laughs> so we want to submit the package and get it deemed complete and then press the bank to cancel this auction you know, and typically when the bank sends out the appraisal, now they're investing a little money in the mm -hmm. deal. They'll typically say, all right, we have a full package. We see the offer. Let's get our appraisal back. And if things make sense, we'll go ahead and cancel the auction. Not all banks will cancel. Though. Some banks will. We've had, they'll leave the auction on the table. They'll review us at the same time. And then when it gets to like the last minute, that's when they will go ahead and cancel it, leaving us in suspense the whole time. But and that's where you really got to be on your A game. You got to follow up with them every two days. You got to say, you know, what are you missing? And if you're not, you know, you're going to do all this work for no reason because the bank is going to just, you know, you got to really make sure they're doing their job. Yeah. So. Nice. Yeah. Awesome. You know, you got, we keep notes. You know, we keep notes. Every phone call um, is recorded. We take good notes on our, on, you know, we take the ID numbers because you got to understand, like, uh, it's not just um, if the bank is telling you no, and they're not really cooperating with you. Now we got to really go above their heads. We leverage the CFPB. Mm -hmm. We file complaints with them. And they're instant. We file a complaint with the CFPB. They're calling the bank 24 hours later. Like, what's going on here? Yeah. And then the bank starts to really open up and, and, and play ball with us. So right. that's been a huge benefit to us. So I remember I read an article years ago before I got into real estate. And I think it was Citibank that got fined for holding way too many properties on their portfolio. And they were doing it for a reason. I think it was just more for write-offs or something like that. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that's still happening because a lot of it just doesn't make sense. A lot of these servicing companies are getting fined left and right. SPS, 
you know, face servicing. I mean, the list goes on. I mean, it's just, there's a lot of moving parts and it's very easily from a bank's perspective, I'm sure to really not do what they're supposed to do, whether it's just lack of staff or they're not really, you know, I think I've, I used to hear my mentor speak about in 2008, they didn't even have um, enough people or the systems to really keep track of a short sale process. And the short mm -hmm. sale process was so much difficult. You know, now they have systems, home path and equator to really keep track of, you know, each bank has their own portal to submit documents, keep track of them. We get receipts from the bank in our emails as proof that you received our documents. You know, why haven't they been reviewed? So, um, it's a lot, you know, and someone coming in, it took me a really long time, um, to really learn this, um, because I was doing it every single day. I was calling the banks and they were telling me, you know, like, they would just give me the runaround and then I would be like, wait, this, this is not right. You know, like, <laughs> I need, I need to stop this, you know? So you learn a lot as you consistently do it. And I've yeah. been, you know, me and my company a couple of years, six years now, and it's, it's been a lot of lessons and more to come. I'm sure. That's so, awesome. Yeah. Thank you. So do, do we want to, uh, if, for, if, if someone wanted to get in contact with you, like if they know someone that's going through something right now and they, sure. And they have a, a foreclosure looming or an issue with a family member that may have a property that's just sitting there. How do they get in contact with you? Yeah, absolutely. You can call my cell phone directly. Uh, it's 347-417-3190. You can also email me at william at sharprealtysolutions.com. It's william at sharprealtysolutions.com. I'm on Instagram, Facebook. Um, not that hard to get in touch with, but any, any situation, you know. Um, Typically, you know, guys call me up and just for advice, um, and I'll, I'll walk you through the deal, you know, so um, whatever help you guys need. Awesome. Absolutely. That's cool. Yeah. Sounds uh, sounds like a real tedious process. And, you yeah, know, God bless yeah. You I mean, your it's, patience, man. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I've been through the entire <laughs> process start to finish, so, you know, I've, uh, it's, not easy man um mm -mm. so that that's why it's something that i never personally got into um you know like kind of specializing in it so if you know somebody gets into a short sale type of situation or even foreclosure i'll usually pass it on you know? <laughs> right yeah <laughs> pass yeah. it with willie <laughs> exactly exactly you know so yeah you're doing a disservice if you're not really connecting with someone that really knows the game yeah because you'll you'll try to really help the homeowner out and then you'll just bury them in foreclosure so gotcha yep so all right cool yeah so we're gonna go on to the next segment we had a viewer reach out to us um that has a property down in florida in port st uh, port st lucy right and she's she has a lot of questions because she currently has the house rented out but it's way under market value evidently mm -hmm. and uh, so she wants to maybe dress it up a little bit, put some lipstick on it, right? Yeah. And try to get the, the rent, up, but she doesn't, what I explained to her when I was talking to her, she does, I don't think she wants, to, she shouldn't go over her head on getting this house fixed up because the next tenants are just, you know, gonna pretty much do the same as they did, you know, as the previous tenants did. So if uh, we have her information here, I'm gonna give her a call. We tried to do it a little bit different but it didn't quite work out. Yeah. So I'm gonna put her here on speaker. Her name is Suzanne and, um, She's got a couple questions for you. Of course. Let's see. Let's take a look. Let's see if we get someone on the line here. Here's the, the details of the property. Hi. Hey, Susan. Can you hear? Yes, I can. Hey, Susan. How are you? Hello. Nice to meet you. Same. So awesome. explain to uh, Joey um, what's going on. You know, how'd you land on this property? What's going on with the rent? And and what your plans are right now for this property. Okay. Um, so my grandparents built the house. Oh, um, okay. It was built in 1987. I inherited the house from then. And um, I got, I re, I got it into my name uh, in 2017. Okay. So I had, I put it on the, I put it as a rental um, and I, wasn't able to rent it for a few months. And then I realized it was probably the rugs. <laughs> so, um, I found there was a, an assistance 
a contractor's assistant who who knew my grandfather and he came over and said what do you want to do to the house and i said well um i'm eventually going to live here but for now i have to stay in new york because my kids are in new york and i want to i'm thinking of renting it right now sure um so you know he told me what he does and then i i asked him well what do you can you do the painting on the outside because it really needed a refreshment i mean it wasn't touched my grandparents didn't do anything to it they were very oh. old and it, they were getting tired of you know doing anything around the house so we did the painting on the outside painting on the inside and then i changed the floors took out the rugs and i added the the vinyl like, wood floors. planking thing oh okay yeah look and i was looks like uh know? vinyl floors from the yes, pictures i did that yeah mm -hmm. So back in 2017, I rented it for 1400 Okay. You know, it was helping me out with the taxes and putting money into the pocket to do other little things around the house that I needed. Sure. And um, she's been there since. And now I'm realizing around the neighborhood that the same house is going for about $2,400 a month. And I know that it's not right for me just to do a big increase, but I also know that the house needs work. <laughs> Mm -hmm. so um i had a few ideas and i didn't know where to start um yeah so looks like you did some of the basic stuff to the house yeah. uh painting the house doing the the flooring uh which is kind of where i would normally start off with first of all right uh after you do that then you get into uh, the more, how do I say, the the bigger ticket items, right? That would be the bathrooms, the kitchen, maybe the, uh, depending on the age of the HVAC system, you know, um, upgrading that, uh, the, the roof, you know, uh, doing maybe a patio outside, um, you know, because it, it, it's ever expanding, right? With the yeah. house is never necessarily done um you know so when i when i uh, i'm kind of scrolling through the pictures um you know we, we can't really unfortunately we can't really show the audience but um you know so so to me it looks like a an outdated house right but you know from the pictures it's pretty well kept um so that that would be the next step I would get into uh, up, upgrading the the bathrooms. Uh, I would you know it and again it all depends on what your budgets are too, right? And also you don't want to over renovate to what the house. Um, do do you understand what a, a ARV is? No. Okay, so ARV is basically the the value of the house after everything's been renovated okay um okay. meaning what you can sell the house for uh if, if you were to sell the house for, uh let's say in well right now right but if you were to sell the house um after you did all your renovations okay so it's not necessarily yeah. the the fair market value of the house now okay so for example um so the the thing is i don't really know florida you know house values right so what would you say the house is worth now uh compared to what the house would be worth if you had a brand new kitchen and a brand new bathrooms so that's kind of something you you sort of need to figure out and then you, you want to see if there's a, a difference in that number. So uh, I'll give you a quick example. Let's say if, if you sold the house the way it is right now today, right? And it, let's say it's worth 350 But if you had, if you looked at a neighbor's house and that neighbor, their house is, let's say, worth 450 and it's all brand new, totally renovated, you know? So the difference is, let's say $100,000, right? Yes. Uh, so now, if you put in a brand new kitchen and let's say two bathrooms, because th that's how many you have, right? It looks like. Uh, yes. So let's say each bathroom costs you 10000 
right? So you're 20,000 into the bathrooms and then the kitchen, let's say it costs you 20,000. So now you're $40,000 into the renovation, but you have a $100,000 uh, kind of like a gap, right? So to me, it'd be worth it to put in that $40,000 to make the house worth 450, you know? So that's kind of how I do my calculation to figure out, you know, is it worth it to put that money in or is it not? She's on the black on this because is, there's no mortgage on the house either. Okay. It's completely paid off. Okay. So everything's a profit right now. Yeah. No, the, and that's, that's even better. So um, the other thing I would, I would do, depending on, um, you know, what, what your, uh, I guess, money situation is, right, is, you know, um, are you coming out of pocket to do these renovations? That, that's one thing I, I would kind of think about, right? Um, if I have the cash and I don't want to put a, another, like remortgage the property, then I would just come, you know, come out of pocket, do the renovation, right? Cause, cause now your, your property renovated would be worth more and you can probably demand more money in terms of rent because it's, more, you know, better renovated, right? Uh, so now the situation with the tenant, um, is the tenant still there? Yes, the tenant is still there. Okay. So my, my point of view is this, w when you have a tenant at the property, I n wouldn't necessarily renovate with the tenant there. I would only do larger renovations when the tenant moves out. That's kind of okay. like my, you know, my thought process, right? Because it's very difficult to s tell the tenant, Hey, I'm going to increase your rent $500 because, you know, I renovated the kitchen, you know, or, or that the, the market value of all my neighbors went up or, or the rent has all gone up. So th that's kind of, um, something you have to, I guess, debate, you know, internally, right? And figure out like, can I, uh, can I get rid of the tenant, uh, or do I want to keep the tenant? Because if I, uh, if I keep the tenant, I can only go up, let's say a reasonable amount, right? To say, hey, uh, I'll keep you, but this year we're gonna increase your your rent, let's say two hundred dollars or three hundred dollars, you know, and that's not unreasonable either. Okay, and then next year, we're going to do the same until we get up to market value, and then we'll slow the increase. I think she was planning on not renewing the lease. Okay. Yeah, if you don't renew the lease, um, then I, you know, and if you have the money or, or maybe you, you could do a, uh, um, like a HELOC. That's what or, she's planning on doing. Okay, okay. Uh, um, yeah, I would do a HELOC and then, you know, take that money, renovate the property then get a market value tenant in there, you know, for yes. a few years until you're ready to kind of move in, you know, and then you would just need to, once, once you get rid of that second tenant, then you, you would just do like a refresh, you know, and then everything else would be hopefully, you know, renovated already by yeah. the time you get to okay. move in. You know, um, the other, the other thing is, uh, you could always get rid of this client, maybe come in and do Airbnb, you know, if, if it's allowed in, in that neighborhood. Um, this is all part of like in the different episode, Joey was talking about having different e exit strategies. Yeah. Yeah. So Airbnb, you wouldn't necessarily need to like sell the property, right? You, you can hire a local uh, manager to come in and sort of manage it for you and you know make you probably make more than you do now right and pay some and, and still afford to pay somebody especially you know being in Florida you know so that's yeah. that's another option uh, once you kind of get rid of this tenant and you may not even need to fully renovate for the Airbnb either you know so that's, like I said, that's another way to increase that income. You have any suggestions? Um, no, I think that's a great idea. Um, yeah. I agree. 
totally agree. Yeah. She had, I think she had some questions about, mm-hmm. you know, I was talking to her offline about, you know, the $80 sink, the $100 sink, and then the $300 sink, right? Right. So she's trying to get a handle of how much do you think she, obviously, we, we weren't able to get any updated pictures to see exactly mm-hmm. what needs to be repaired and updated. But she knows for sure that the roof needs to be replaced. Oh, okay. It's, um, it's hard to see. Yeah, because these are the okay. MLS, the, the tenant, she sent a contractor in to get a, a quote really? uh, last week. Yeah. But the the tenant, fortunately, didn't want the contractor taking any indoor pic, interior pictures. Okay. I so, mean, uh, based on the pictures. It looks like it's in good shape. Yeah. This is 2018 when she first listed it. Okay. No, these pictures are from the MLS from 2018. Okay. Right, I mean, Susan? The, these are from 2017. 17. Hold on a minute. So six years. Yeah. Okay, six years. 2017. I mean, based on the pictures, I don't know if it, the roof is going to deteriorate that quickly, but um, the roof back then looks pretty good. Um, so, you know. So, again, has I, there I been don't any know. Any how, major storms or anything like that that could have. Are there any leaks that the tenant is mentioning? Well, I had. I did have, um, I had a roof repair uh, two weeks ago. I did. I did a patch up. And, okay. Um, so there is a guy leak. Told me, yeah, there was a leak. So the guy told me, look, I did. He went into the attic. He looked around. He says, this is where the problem is. This is what I'm going to do. It only cost me a thousand. He said, this will work for five years. Okay. So I was okay to hear five years more <laughs> for a thousand dollars. Yeah. That's, that's not um, too bad. Yeah, and then, um, so my grandparents had made, from the original uh, plan, they made an addition to the house, which Mm. they put in a second garage and a back room. And I was, last night I was thinking also, I said, you know, I was talking to my husband, I said, you know, maybe we can, um, when we go to talk to her about the lease, we can tell her that the way she only uses one garage, that now we're going to, because I, I wanted to do on that addition, I wanted to do like a daughter mother suite where I close off that side of the house. Right. And I told my husband, maybe we can just tell her that that side of the house, including that bedroom, is not going to be in the lease. Um, so she has an option. She can either, you know, find somewhere else to move or understand that we're going to close that out because we're going to be working on that side of the house so that I can start my my one bedroom suite. Cause I need a, I can have, I can go down there and stay when I do go to Florida mm-hmm. and then I can rent the other three bedrooms. I don't need that much space. Sure. Yeah. Again, um, I would probably, you know, once, once you have her gone, I, I would try to do either like a short term rental or, uh, or even a midterm rental, you know, where you're, you're renting like 30, 30, 60, 90 days at a time. Okay. Yeah. You know. So those are some other options too. Well, if if you didn't want to tie tie up the property, you know. Um are are yeah. you close to moving down there? Or or that's like a few years away. How how old are your kids? I am um I have a junior, so when he graduates a senior year, um so I'm about two years, three years away from moving down there. Okay. All right. Yeah, so it, it's kind of like I don't know. It's kind of in, intermediate. So, you know, because yeah. when somebody rents a place, they want to be in, you know, like most people that do rent, they, they don't say, hey, I'm going to move in for only a year, right? They usually want to be there longer. It, it depends. So you, you could obviously, you could always talk to, uh, especially if it's like, uh, let's say a younger couple or younger family and, and, you know that they're they are just kind of like renting for the time being until they find more or less like they're buying a house soon mm-hmm. because I, I i did that myself right because i rented a property for a year while i was looking for a house you know and then uh my my lease ended as as i you know i i, I finished up my house you know okay. so i, I moved okay. like so you might want to look for somebody like that, you know, for maybe like a year or two years. And then that final, that final year, maybe go and do the short term, you know, okay. because, you know, I, but, you know, I, again, I, I don't know your situation like that closely, you know, 
but that's just off the top of my head. That's kind of what I'm thinking. So I have a question. Like, sure. if I did, so if I did for you're saying mostly in the budget would probably be like twenty grand for both bathrooms, twenty grand for a kitchen. Oh no, I I, I have no um, idea. I'd be honest with yeah. you. Um, because just, how every long does con- something like that happen? I mean, how long does something like that take to you know upgrade? So each so for for me like my company you know it, it takes us about ten days to renovate each bathroom, okay? okay. And then a kitchen takes a little longer. Uh, the kitchen okay. usually takes about a month to two months to do. Okay. Now that also includes you know getting permits and and all this stuff, right? So you know if if, if you're not Let's say you're not applying for permits, you're not changing the layout or anything like that. So again, I don't know Florida in terms of um, what you need township wise and all that stuff, right? Uh, so as far as like New Jersey goes, if you're not changing where the sinks are, where the range is, you don't need to get a permit. If it's like like for like, you know, so if you're swapping out, like an old stove for a new stove, same location, right? You don't need a permit. If you're taking out the old cabinets, putting new cabinets, same location, you don't need permits. If you're just kind of painting and putting new flooring in, you know, again, you don't need permits, right? But if you're knocking down a load-bearing wall, you're putting a new beam there, opening up a window, those things you need a permit for in New Jersey. Again, I don't know Florida. So... Okay. So, you know, um, and, and then um, as far as pricing, I would just bring in two to three different contractors, get them in, okay. and have them give you prices. You know, you o- always uh, want to compare prices, you know? Okay. Yeah, don't just settle for the first guy that comes in and, and he's a great salesman. Like Jay Z said, no disrespect to you. Just want to make sure your word is true. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So you know, so the, those are some of the things I I would definitely do, and then um, you know, just vet them. Also, you know, find out who did they work for, you know, and uh, can you have their phone number, their their client's number. You know, and then call the client, you know, hey, are you related to this guy? Is this your cousin? You know, because the, some people will give you their like relatives number, you know, and they don't have true like client list, you know, like for me is like, OK, do you want a referral? OK, I'll give you a list of 10 names. Call any of them. I don't, you know, or more than 10, you know, uh, so it you want to vet those guys the contract because that's what's going to make or break this project or any project really maybe get a home inspection report did you just mention that maybe that i know it's additional cost but maybe that might help yeah i mean getting a home inspection is, is not the worst idea ever um you know just especially because you're far away and then that home inspector would be able to tell you hey you know you have some leak you didn't even know about because the tenant never told you or you know something's out of date and you want to upgrade it so that it's it's updated so and it's not that expensive uh the home inspection it's like what four to five hundred bucks you know so it's i think is well worth it i know in florida now with all the uh not the regulations but with a lot of insurance companies bailing out of Florida and California because of the amount of mm. hurricanes and earthquakes and all that good stuff. Wildfires. So, yeah, wildfires. Do you know, Susan, if um, if if it's actually a requirement by an insurance company that the roof be repaired after? I know I, I, someone so, told me after fifteen years or something like that. Well, the and the last I we knew every year, and the last time she told me was um, you'll probably need you know, a new roof in a few years. Um, and they send out, I guess, wind mitigation guys every year to look at it. Yeah. That, but, um, yeah. you made a good point about inspection. Like if I wanted to go and have an inspector go look, because, you know, in the back of my head about doing like the 20, you know, the bathrooms and stuff, I'm like, okay, I can go and put something new, but what happens if there's something in the background, you know, 
when I do decide to go there, I have to rip everything out to fix it. So doing an inspection even before doing the little upgrades does make a lot of sense. Right, because you you don't you don't know, right? Um, you're not you like a, a professional contractor or anything like that. So yes, yeah, I would definitely. Uh, you know, get somebody out there who, who actually knows, who's kind of like a third party, you know? Yes. Yeah. Yes, I like that. Okay. So. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, that that's what I do when I buy houses out of state that, you know, like, for example, I bought a house out in uh, San Antonio. And, you know, I told the home inspector, hey, um, shoot me a video and obviously, you know, send me photos of everything that's wrong, right? Because you, you're going to, you're going to, do the home inspection report anyway. And then also I want to make sure that that house actually exists hmm. because I'm, I'm not, I'm not flying out to San Antonio, first of all. <laughs> right. So, you know, I want to make sure. And, and I, I chose this home inspector. It wasn't a referral. You know, I like, I went to, uh, I went on Facebook. I joined the home inspection, um, like community. You know, there, there's like a group of home inspectors, right? And I just went in there and I was like, hey, who, who's a local inspector that does like, you know, s this town in San Antonio? And then a few guys messaged me like, yeah, I do, I do. And then I just asked them, hey, um, you know, how much, you know, what do you charge? And, you know, and can you do this? And they were like, yeah, of course, you know, uh, so, you know, I just hired one of them and actually, I, you know, he's still my Facebook friend to this day, you know. Um, so, you know, I, I sent him there. He did his thing. Um, I, I gave him a deposit first, you know, and then he, he went there, did his thing, and I paid him the second half after the inspection. And, um, you know, the house actually was there. Uh, it was actually not too many things wrong with the house. And... After that, you know, I hired a, a contractor to come in, fix some of the stuff that needed done. And then, you know, that was it. Another dilemma that might come up is when, let's say she hires the inspector and now the tenant is also being hesitant again about taking pictures or letting him in. And um, how does she handle so, such, so a situation So you need like to, that? yeah, you, you got to definitely so start talk. ordering pizza to his house every Friday. Mm -hmm. Um, and get get a good relationship going. I mean, you got to get send them an Amazon package. Just make them smile. You know, like you got to really if they're being hostile with you, you have to really get creative and think like, you know, how can I get this tenant on my side? You know, are you in a good relationship with them, Susan? Oh yeah, I mean, she oh. whenever she tells me that there's something going on, you know, we had an ant problem. Like within a day, she gets I get service out there to fix whatever the problem is. That's, oh, that's good. Yeah, you're yeah. good like, landlord. Really good. Any anything she needs, you know, she she says, "Oh my, you know, my my fiance wants to paint the bathroom." No, that's fine. Go ahead, paint the bathroom. You know, it's yeah. okay. <laughs> How many people actually live um, in the house? So it's her fiance and her daughter. Well, and how much? Three people. And how much are they paying in rent right now? Right now, I have it for fifteen hundred and fifteen fifty. Wow, you saw the picture. And in that area, yeah, there's nice. not, you know, it's. it's, it's very good. It's a bargain for them. You don't get that. Out it's here. around nine hundred dollars on the. We we checked it. It's like nine hundred dollars under the market rent right now. Really? Yeah. 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 Wow. Yeah. I wouldn't say Lucy. So it's, my yeah, I, I have nice so I have notes and basically I would have to be without a tenant probably for about six months to make sure that everything's upgraded the right way with inspection and with ten days of each bathroom and sixty days for the kitchen. What do you think? Is that right? Yeah, I mean, you can do it simultaneously, you know. Um, but I, honestly, I wouldn't do it with her there. You know, uh, once she leaves, no, then, then I would do it. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But those are the two big things I, I saw. Everything else looks okay. You know, I mean, there's only so much you could do with the uh, living room, dining room, things like that, right? Those are, those are just basic paint. Yeah, exactly. So those are just basic paints. You know, maybe you want to upgrade the doors. Um, you know, that's that's really it. There's not much else. You just go to Home Depot and go to the gentrified uh, gray aisle, paint it, you know, the white <laughs> and gray, <laughs> the basic colors. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Don't make so. it too yeah. difficult. Not the highest grade paint. You're not looking for the Ralph Lauren stuff. Or any of that kind yeah. Of, yeah. 
so basic bear and stuff like that yeah i i honestly wouldn't use bear but you know that's the only um, that's the first name i thought of <laughs> yeah well, gildian sure. gildian is that the one huh gildian or is that the no, no 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 uh benjamin moore benjamin okay Moore. yeah don't, don't don't go to home depot for paint no no matter how many times they say it's number one like number one where you know <laughs> would you say lowe's or just go to uh, like a basic no benjamin I, uh, moore, like like benjamin moore yeah, there, there's somebody that sells Benjamin Moore paint. It, it's kind of like a mom and pop sh- shop store. Gotcha. Yeah, and, and they'll sell uh, Benjamin Moore. So I would do that. That the answer your questions. You have another question? No, actually, I have. A, I've gotten a lot of information from this. Thank you so much. Awesome. Yeah, thank it you. It made me made me like put things into perspective as to where to start and not to be nervous about upgrading, but definitely do an inspection so that I can change whatever I want to do when I am there and not doing two different, like not ripping things out again, you know, after I am there, I want to do it the right way inexpensively. Yeah, absolutely. Sounds good. Awesome. I mean, thank you so much. Thank you. Good luck. And if you yes. have any questions and you want to come back on the show, let us know. Or, or, yeah, or we send can us talk pictures. offline too. Yeah, show us pictures. You know, next year of uh, yeah, how the renovation how, how the renovation ended up being. Maybe this will be oh, a, a, yes. a second parter yeah. somewhere down the well, road. Um, you'll hear from me come, I guess, February when she's out and I have an inspection. Then I can tell you the updates. And and he can go down there for Airbnb. <laughs> 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 okay, Susan. Thank you so much. All right, You're welcome. Thank you. Bye bye. Joe, that was great, man. Yeah, thank you. If any of you guys, you know, I don't want to inundate you, but if you guys have any projects that you're working on and you'd like for, you know, the experts here to take a look at it. I actually got one right now that I want to see Joe's yeah. opinion on. I'm actually okay. in, I'm, okay. I'm in attorney review right now for this one. All right. And, uh, just bit. take take a little look at it and tell me what you think. Single family, okay. four that beds, two beds. Point Pleasant. Point Pleasant. Uh, the, the wood looks like East Orange. Yeah. <laughs> House is like a hundred years old. Yeah. It's old, not that bad. Old actually. plumbing, old electricity, right? Yeah. So the only thing that it looks like everything just needs to be really updated, right? Mm-hmm. So there's actually structural issues on this. Oh, okay. Um, and so I have an inspection report here. So I wanted to see if you take a look at it and. Because I'm going to be diving into getting a couple contractors over there yeah. and seeing how much this renovation is going to cost. But let me just try to see where the joist that they found um, is rotted. Um, this is going to be my first project This with a big renovation. Where is it? Um, well, the other house you did. Um, yeah, but that didn't have structural issues. Oh, okay. I okay. mean, people, it's so funny because I've never done anything with structural issues, but mm. you hear structural issues and you think it's like crazy. It, it's really not. That's what I'm, 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 yeah. just like I learned how to do short sales, I'm going to learn how to do this. Right. Same process, ask questions. And then you really start to really think it's not really that serious. Like this beam right here supposedly needs to be completely. Yeah, it, it's it's a you know quote unquote it's a post right. Mm-hmm. So the post uh, from can you zoom in a little bit? Yeah, there you go. Uh, so the post normally you want to have a piece of foundation underneath the post, okay? Like concrete. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So anywhere from like a, a, a two by two feet by two feet concrete, a foot thick, mm-hmm. okay. Um, so what you want to do is kind of ex you, you want to put temporary posts to kind of hold up that beam that's above it, right? Okay. And then you're going to kind of get rid of that post. You're going to excavate around it. You know, you cut like a, a like a rectangle right. below it, two feet by two feet, a foot thick. Okay, and you can throw some rebar in there. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, put concrete. Now, after that, you're going to replace it with let's say a pressure treated uh th- that looks like a six by six or or four by six can to, it still be me. pressure treated where you got to go metal no no it doesn't have to be metal but okay. um it, it could be also so a lot of times you, you see the the basement lolly columns the, the round metal yeah you can you can use that also those so are you, more expensive no they're not they're like a hundred bucks 
Mm-hmm. They're like a, a little over a hundred dollars a piece. But like the, you know, the, the viewers, I can pull it up real quick. Yeah. I won't show the address. Um, and then so like. I, I'm gonna gut the whole place anyway. So now oh, okay. the floors need to be ripped up. Do and they? The subfloor. I don't know. But that's my understanding. How do you? No. How do you? How do you get? You know, the subfloor is a mess. Supposedly, you know. I I honestly wouldn't um, rip it up. Don't rip it up. No. How? I wouldn't rip it up. Well, is it? Can you? Can you walk in there, or is it just a crawl space? The whole, uh, the whole thing is just a crawl space. No, you can stand up in there. Okay. So, yeah, it's if you very can stand small, up in the there, right, if you can, the portion where you can stand up and that needs work, mm-hmm. that area, I would just, you know, kind of fix it. Right? Okay. So you don't have to rip up the whole, even though I'm going to gut these floors. Yeah. If you're going to get rid of the floors, then I would just get rid of that, the but, plywood. You know what it is? The, the house is literally 100 years old. Yeah. Plumbing, electricity, it all has to be completely redone, right. wired. So does it? Am I gonna save any money if the contractor goes and then he says, oh, "I gotta rip everything up," or I could just rip up these wood floors, leave the subfloor, and then just? I I would keep the wood floors honestly. Keep the wood floors. I, I would keep the wood floors, refinish it. Yeah. You know because they look good. They're not um, that bad. Yeah. Right. I would just refinish it. Now the the bathrooms definitely they need to be kind of gutted mm-hmm. and updated. Right. Right. Uh, is that carpet or concrete? Carpet. Yeah, carpet. carpet. Yeah. So I would rip out the carpet, put new vinyl in there. Right. Okay. So, uh, and then the rest of the room is just patch and paint. It, um, can you zoom in on, on the ceiling there? Is, what, what kind of deal is this? Is this a wholesale deal? Or? Yeah, it's wholesale to me, yeah. Okay, someone's selling it off to you? Yeah. Yeah, so the ceiling... Uh, I would just remove, you know, the, the, those suspended ceilings. Maybe keep the wood planks. Right. They're, you know, some character maybe. Yeah. These old radiators got to go because I'm gonna do uh, HVAC. Well, I'm not. It's very tight. I was gonna do uh, those units that go in each room. Uh, what do yeah, you think the, about the that? mini splits. Yeah. You could. You I'm could. gonna be renting this out. Is that the ones that they're doing? I, I would the honestly. I would. I would do I a whole so. house. I would do an HVAC unit because at the end of the day, the mini split's going to end up costing you way more money. Really? Yeah. Does it matter that like this, it's the, the, the basement is, is like, t- it's su- super tiny and the attic, like you can't even go up there. Mm-hmm. So how do you get, how do you run everything? Well, I would run it through the basement. Run it through, through the basement. The- yeah. Cause, cause you have one portion that's like full height, right? Yeah, it's it, but it's so like it's not a full basement. It's literally like the size of this table. Right. Like you just go down the steps, the furnace, water heater, and then like, that's it. That's it. Okay. Yeah. So so what I would do is you know replace that furnace that's there. Mm-hmm. That's all the space you need, and then the rest of it is just ductwork. You know, and you just run it into like the crawl space and everything, and then go up. Okay, so they'll be able to run it through there. Yeah. Okay. Right. <clears throat> what uh, what type of number would you put on? Considering full gut, basically, with the structural, new windows, there's 15 windows. I would say anywhere from about 120 to like 180. 180. Yeah. So it it really depends on the contractor you're you're bringing in. You know, are you bringing in a guy who's more like a day worker, who you're kind of being the general contractor and you're telling everybody what to do. You're picking them up, dropping them off. Probably that's, not. That's, that's one uh, way to do it, right? Another way is just to have uh, a guy who works for somebody and he's kind of doing this as a side gig mm. and he's picking up a couple of guys and coming in and do, doing that for you. Right. Um, or are you hiring a guy who's actually a an actual licensed contractor he's he's coming in he's telling you hey willie let's do this let's do that mm-hmm. you know um and they're relying on yeah him and really... you're kind of relying on him for everything right and then there's the other guy who's like a super super professional you know big company and and they're like just turnkey they just do everything everything yeah right. So that that guy is you're gonna pay he's much gonna more. Be the most that's the guy with yeah. the with the overhead he's, yeah Right. You know, because he's got salespeople, he's got like an office secretary and all right. that stuff. So you just got to be aware, like what, what kind of company you're dealing with. To protect myself, because I'm kind of uh, naive when it comes to this. Mm-hmm. 
would it make sense to just completely gut everything and then start fresh versus like, all right, let's gut the bathrooms and what what I would do if I were you uh, is kind of like what I was telling her is bring in a few guys, mm-hmm. bring in two, three guys, get their opinion, you know, um, because they'll tell you, hey, I could save this. I could you right. know, save that. Uh, and then get their price, right? And what, what, how much do you think everything is going to cost uh, versus how much do you think if you got everything and redid everything? Right, okay. <clears throat> you know, I also need to do like a pool back. This market calls for a pool. A pool, wow. I okay. don't think I'm going to do an underground <clears throat> pool because it's not the numbers are not way too tight for that, but maybe like yeah. something with the deck around. That's probably a cheaper Yeah, option. above ground, yeah. Right. How much additional rent would that bring? Um, so that's why I'm still diving into the numbers because I'm going to get short-term Airbnb rental down here for the summer. Yeah. June, July, August. This is near the beaches? Part of my ignorance. Um, it's close. I mean, it's right in town. Um, so I think a pool would help, but it's only about a 10-minute walk to the beach mm. and, you know, three-minute car drive to the beach. So, and you buy all the shops and everything. So if you had a pool, I think, you know, some of these houses are renting during the summer for like 6 k a week. Yeah, Jeez. you get that like, size. Um, if if it's done right, yeah, with the pool, yeah, absolutely. I'm I'm renting actually. I'm I'm because I'm in the market for this area, and I want to start accumulating properties in this area. I'm renting uh, myself an Airbnb this week for the whole month of for the rest of the summer. So and I'm paying out the ass. I mean, you get a lot. You really get a lot good rent for the summer because you have to cover the winter months as well right you could point pleasant you could actually it's it's pretty lively out there uh, where you could get a winter rental significantly less mm-hmm. but my goal is to really i gotta you know i have a due diligence period on this property hoping the numbers work out where as long as the rent between what the do you summer, mean by due diligence i have 21 days to um get my contractors in there run the numbers see if there's anything else that we haven't seen yet and then really run those numbers because this is not a home run deal. I'm used to a lot of home run deals. I do get a really good deals. This is not, but my goals are different. So I'm willing to take this on and um, make it as a primary rent slash rental, some rental. And um, as long as the debt service can be covered throughout is, the Is that Zillow's estimated property value? Uh, that's the purchase price. Uh, the sale. ARV is about 750. Wow. Um, so it's on the market. It's on the MLS. It was on the MLS. They had a buyer in contract. It was like a home, uh, you know, wasn't an investor. They got scared once they saw the structural issues. Yeah. So a friend of mine who knows the broker who listed it um, called me up and said, hey, you know, um, got this property. I know you're looking in this area. You know, does it make sense? So he's basically wholesaling it to me. And we're getting a little creative on how to really pay him his wholesale fee. Mm-hmm. Um, which is pretty cool. I don't have to really come out of pocket. I'm going to try to um, put it in the loan because um, we had a conventional loan on this. Hard money wouldn't make sense for these numbers. Yeah. So I'm going to do conventional. Um, so I'm hoping the numbers. But are you going to do cash? How, how are no, you gonna... conventional mortgage. No, no, I get that. Oh, for the renovation. <laughs> renovation yeah, what yeah. about the renovation So I'm time? either, I'm, I'm talking <laughs> to the, the lender. I'm talking to the lender now as far as like getting maybe some type of 203K or construction. Yeah. Or I'm going to leverage business credit for the rehab. Zero percent interest, wow. you know. But now, you, I mean, I had a budget around 120, 150. You threw it 180, it's another 30 grand, so. No, again, it depends on who you're, you're bringing in, yeah. contractor-wise. See, my last flip, I had to do things twice. I, had a, I painted the cabinets in the kitchen. The painter screwed me. Thank God Joey saved me with just replacing them. So I don't want to make those mistakes where like doing it twice when I should have just did it the first time. Yeah. Um, and because I don't have that much construction background, you know, whenever you do something new, it's, it's, it's a little nerve wracking. So, yeah. but you it's got, good. You got to figure out the wholesale fee. With, 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 if you're doing a conventional loan, you got to figure out that wholesale fee. Oh, it's 10 K. Um, and we'll probably do like a seller's concession and then that will cover my closing costs. And then I could probably pay, you know, the wholesale fee, like, out of pocket that way, but it's kind of like the, and the title company is going to play ball with that yeah. along with, with the bank. Yeah. This is not a short sale. This is a traditional wholesale deal. So, um, as long as the seller's okay with it, then, you know, they're getting their net. Shouldn't really yeah, they matter. Don't really care. I'm sure that it's underwrite. It's going to go into underwriting. I'm sure it will come out and 
um, we'll have to just write, you know, I just closed on a property with conventional financing when using TD bank. It was a nightmare. <laughs> it was a complete nightmare. I mean, they put me through so many Sorry conditions. For laughing. You know, my mortgage processor, isn't he that you're a lender, right? I'm a, I'm a direct lender. So, you know, the processor is supposed to review everything before it goes into underwriting, right? Isn't he supposed on to. supposed to be on your team just to make sure they're all supposed to be on your team? Well, you know, my my uh, processor, you know, I submitted profit and loss balance sheets and you know, he, he didn't You're even going through brick and mortar. I'll give you my business card. Please, please. <laughs> <laughs> please, because I'm also looking at another property out here. It's a bigger purchase um, and that actually might call for the rent is a little higher um, and that might I need a DSCR loan. So I've been talking to a lot of guys. I can help you with that as well. Yeah. OK, we'll definitely have to talk about that because, you know, um, the conventional, it just wipes you out. You know, like the oh, yeah. 90 days of just... And they're very tedious with the process and the paperwork. That's yeah. why I was going to say I wouldn't suggest it. Knowing wholesaling and what you need to do here, I wouldn't suggest it to a right. 3K. No. I would go unconventional with this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the problem is the, the interest rate and the numbers, and then I don't want to have to put 25%. If I put 25% down, these numbers are so tight where I'm like, I'll never see my money again. <laughs> but my goals for this property is is different. You got so a long term. Yeah. Um, but I'd rather just put down 5%, you know, hold on. So you're not getting this property at a deep discount? No, no, no. No, it didn't all. look like it. No, it not at all. Like and in this area, it's funny because I've been, everyone pays their bills in this market. It's a, you know, beach market. And I, I stalked the auction list looking for a property in this area. There's not that many that come on. There's nothing in the auctions. No. Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, because the auctions. A, a lot of these, a lot of these, first of all, are like second homes, third homes. Right. So you know, the, these are people that can't afford it. Right. So it, it's not like you know they're they're dying. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So, awesome. But um, let's. Uh, I, I think we need to end the show at some point because <laughs> <This is laughs> we can awesome, keep man. going. Yeah. You know. I hope, I hope the listeners uh, I really this. appreciated uh, this, yeah, this episode. Yeah. So, Guys, thank you so much for, you know, tuning in, whoever's tuning in. And, uh, of, of course, uh, my name is Joey Chan, Willie Delinko, Joe Fala. Um, how can uh, they reach you, Joe? Uh, I can be reached on all so social media. Joe does mortgages, 908-669-9091. If you're looking for an FHA, VA, uh, DSCR loan, uh, bank statement loan, any kind of loans that you could think of, I can help you out with them. Is FHA really giving 100% financing right now? I Where? just heard something um, last week that FHA is giving 100% financing. Oh. No, not that I know. Yeah, that's what I just heard. There's a lot of I heard you. Yes, that's true. I kind of try to come that, well, that's why I demystify that's, those. That's, that's, <laughs> why ex, that's why I asked yeah, the lender. Yeah. <laughs> you, when, you caught me off guard because I'm trying to think of what I saw on YouTube. Right, right. right. <laughs> uh, no, they're, they're, they're doing some um, incentives as far as um, uh, down payment assistance. Okay. But nothing with 100% financing. How soon, real quick, before we go, can I refinance the house that I just closed on with conventional? It's an investment property. I think up to six months. Six months I can have yeah. to, okay. 70% or more I can take out. It depends on the deal. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so, um, Willie, give your information again. Uh, you can find me on Instagram, Sharp Realty Solutions. Uh, William at Sharp Realty Solutions. My email and my direct phone number is 347 417 3190. And I'm Joey Chan. Thank you once again. Uh, we are here live at Kitchen Design Lab. And call us for any kitchen cabinets, countertop, and vinyl flooring needs. Thank you. Have a great day.